Greetings, everyone. This is Yoftahe Mulat Gavru once again back at you from the Yoftahe show. We'll be live on Facebook Live and then the video will be uploaded later on, as usual, on YouTube. Uh, today, it's, an, um, it's one of the things that I always have uh, to be involved uh, with the heart that we have, like open hearts, big dreams. Uh, what they have been able to accomplish is something that we all um, want to hear about and literacy. Uh, language preservation, technology, it is something that we all need to pass on to our kids. And uh, being born in Ethiopia, and then I understand uh, growing up, we didn't have a lot of children uh, books, especially for the, uh, what I call outside the city part. And uh, Open Heart, uh, Big Dreams is trying to address many of that. So we'll be introduced to so many amazing team members uh, that we have here. And this is very close uh, personal uh, for me, because education is one way that we can defeat poverty, and especially in Ethiopia or any, anywhere in the world. Uh, so uh, reading is fundamental to everything that we need to do in this world. And uh, we have a lot of uh, um, back and forth. So we'll have a family uh, discussion while we are here. And I want to introduce all of my guests right now in here. Amazing, amazing group. Uh, that we have. Welcome everyone from Open Hearts Big Dream. Uh, this is an amazing, uh, some of you have already been on the Yof Tahe show before and most of you are here new. Uh, so this is a family discussion and so we'll open it up. Um, but first, just shortly, just introduce yourself. So I'll call the names and then I'll go in and then we'll go on in detail how you got involved, what part of the program that you uh, you are responsible for. So we'll go in detail as we go on. Again, for the people who are joining us, we are live on Facebook. Please make sure to share, comment, any question that you have for Open Hearts, Big Dreams. We'll send you also the link, how you need to get involved, how you can donate, how you can be part of it, how you can volunteer. All of those funds are gonna come and talk about it as we go on. Once again, this is Yoftahe from the Yoftahe Show. So welcome. I'm going to start with Eleanor and Leah. If, uh, if uh, Eleanor, if you can introduce yourself and uh, let me start with you then. Perfect. Well, we're so honored to be here. Um, my name is Eleanor Angelitis. I am, am the founder of Open Hearts Big Dreams, but just one member of a team of hundreds who are giving uh, their time and their talent and their treasures. Um, I am a lawyer by training, but I followed a very non-linear path to end up here as a not-for-profit founder. Thank you, thank you, Eleanor. It's an honor to have you here with everything that you've been doing. And then next to you, we have beautiful Leah and the whole reason we are, all of this got started also. Uh, Leila, if you can introduce yourself, uh, let me come to you. Hello, my name is Leila Marie Fezikat Angelitis. I'm a seventh grader at Penn Lake Middle School and I've been volunteering with Open Hearts Big Dreams since I was three years old. I was born in Ethiopia and specifically Bahadar. Bahadar. Leila, it's great to have you here. Your mom has told me so much about you and it's an honor to have you here. Uh, yes. <laughs> you have to, you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> all good things, all good things. How old are you before I go on quickly? 13. 13. I have two daughters, one 17 and one 16. So um, definitely it's good to see you here and have you. And then I'm gonna, just going to go from screen from the top down, Dr. Workul, if you can introduce yourself, please. Thank you. My name is Workul Mulat. I live here in Washington. I am applied ecologist by training and uh, by chance, or as you call it, by serendipity, I met Eleanor at Microsoft and she asked me if I could help her. And I accepted the, uh, I, I gladly accepted the offer. And uh, now I'm working as uh, innovation lead and I'm the one who is organizing things from Ethiopians in, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Wargo. It's an honor to have you here. And then let me go to Jane. Great to have you in here. Thank you so much. My name is Jane Kurtz and I live in Portland, Oregon. I was born here in Portland, but when I was two, my parents moved to Ethiopia. And so I spent almost all of my childhood in Ethiopia, first in Addis Ababa and then way down in the rural part of Ethiopia 
near the town of Maji. So I learned how to read in Ethiopia. And when I came back to the United States for college, I never thought I would have a chance to work on literacy in Ethiopia. But years later, after I had become a published children's book author, I was invited to speak in international schools in Addis Ababa. And that was my first chance to go back and after 20 years and to see what was happening with literacy. So I have been a volunteer for literacy for about 20 years now. Also, my, my daughter and one of my sons went to volunteer for literacy and my son got married in Ethiopia. So I have a daughter-in-law who is Ethiopian and my grandchildren are Ethiopian American living here in the United States. So like a lot of you, I'm very interested not only in literacy for children in Ethiopia, but for helping all of our young people here in the United States and all the way around the world learn to read better, but also learn to celebrate their heritage and their culture. Amazing. That's like you are an Ethiopian American yourself, too. So <laughs> definitely deep connection right there. So uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So we'll come back to all of that in a little bit. And then we have two Bethlehem. So uh, sometimes I'm going to address uh, uh, Bethlehem and then uh, Bethlehem Legacy. And then you have also your sister in there, because if I don't see your name, you'll be able to let us know. So let me come to the first Bethlehem, if, uh, if you can introduce yourself. You're muted. Hi, Lam. Thank you, you have Tay, for having us here. Um, so a little bit about me. I was just another corporate rat. I was working in IT for a long time until I had my second kid. And then I decided to be a professional stay-at-home mom, <laughs> meaning just stay at home. And then, uh, but literacy and education in Ethiopia has always been in my heart. And I've always been trying to find a way to get involved. And sometimes it just works out. And I happen to be in a Habesha mom group that Eleanor was in. And so when I saw that, I had to just jump on that opportunity. And then we talked and we just connected because both of our hearts are in the same place, which is Ethiopian education and literacy. Since I, I moved out to the States when I was younger, but I never, forgot my roots in a way. So I always wanted to go back and do something, but the opportunity came here to me. And that's how I felt. It just came to me. So I had to join. I had to say, yes, it's a great, great organization. I'm just happy to be part of it and doing great work with her. Thank you. Thank you. So good. You saw the heart, you saw the connection and you jumped at it and here we are. So it's definitely, I like those kind of connection. And because sometimes the little things you never know where it takes us. It's just that first yes, that first shake hand. It takes us uh, in so many ways. Jacob, uh, Jacob, it's great to have you here. So if you can introduce yourself too. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob Omad, and I was born and raised in Ethiopia. So I moved to the United States in 2014. I went to school here. I studied neuroscience at the University of Minnesota, and I'm now working there as a researcher uh, for the medical school and neuroscience department. I met Ellen uh, through Obala. So Obala met Ellen in DC. And so I, I always wanted to, to work with the kids and, and, and make children books. So Obala, when he came back from DC, he told me about this and I was like, really? the organizations like this exist in the United States. And it was like, yeah. And yeah, I was so excited and, and I joined it right away. And uh, now I'm doing translation for the IMAC. Thank you, thank you. That's an amazing one. Obala, you're not new for the Yofta Hey Show. You've been here so many times and it's good to have you back, brother. Uh, so if you can tell us, just in case there are some people who might not see you before. So if you can introduce yourself. Hello, uh, my name is Obala Obala. I'm a councilman here in Austin, Minnesota. Um, I was born in Ethiopia, but moved uh, in America eight years ago. And um, I met Helen and, uh, and our daughter uh, uh, in DC a few months ago. And um, we were talking in uh, uh, 
Oh, I, I met uh, Eleanor in uh, in uh, in Washington D.C. through Ellen Show. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, and then um, when I was when I finished talking, and then I saw the work they are doing. They were you know set uh, at the background, and then everyone will go to them and talk to them. I'm like, let me check those beautiful people out. And when I went there, I saw those book, and the way they explained it to me, I'm like this is what I've been looking for to have it in my language. So, and after that, it took her like two seconds. When I explained it to her, she's like, boom, give me your email, you are in. And I'm like, really, just like that, any sign up? And she's like, nope, that's all what you need to do. If you're interested and you wanna do it for uh, uh, um, uh, your language and uh, the, the people back home and here, you are in it. And I'm like, you don't have to ask me twice. So and then <laughs> here I am. And then when I come back, I'm like, I don't, I speak Anyuak, but I, I cannot write it out like as good. And then, and Amaric is gone already. And I'm like, okay, there's someone I can connect and I can use this person because he's very smart. And uh, I'm like, Jacob. So Jacob and I have been thinking about something like this for years, but this opportunity just pop up and Jacob was like, there we go. This is what we've been looking for. And here we are. Um, joining by the most amazing people. So looking forward. I like I like the story. That's what I learned was telling me. I made Obala, she said, and then he says, let's go at it, he said. So here we are. So I like those action and not wasting any time. So definitely language preservation is definitely a big thing that we have to do because especially when this kind of book have never been printed and uh, we need to make sure the kids understand it, read it and get to know about it. So I'm very excited to know, to learn more about as we go. And then we have two young ladies, Bethlehem and then, sorry, I didn't catch your name. If you can both introduce yourself quickly, please. Yes, um, thank you so much for having us. Um, it's an honor to be here. My name is Beth, the Bethlehem Legacy. Um, and I'm a software engineer at Influx Data. It's a software company at, at San Francisco. And go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, my name is Faven Legacy, and uh, we're related to Marco, the, he's our dad. Um, so he invited us here to tell us, uh, for us to tell you a little bit about our journey into software engineering. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, and um, hopefully we'll share a little bit more with you um, in a little bit. Thank you, thank you. Like you heard it all, we have amazing lineup here for you. So just share, join us, ask a question, and then we'll have fun as we go. And then we are live on the Yof Tahe show, like I said, and then some people who are already asking if it's gonna be on YouTube, definitely will be on YouTube uh, later on. So just like any project, any dream, it starts somewhere because of someone, because of any, some kind of reasons. So we have to start from the beginning. So Eleanor, I'm going to come to you. Why are we here? How did this get started? You're muted. It's uh, a little bit of a few things, but it starts with a mom's project or a family project. I'm a child of immigrants. Um, I married another immigrant from Greece. So culture is really important to us. So when our daughter joined our family, we really wanted to connect both her and the rest of the family to her first culture and her first country. So that was sort of reason number one. My family, it, our family of educators, I am a lawyer. I'm the only one in the family. I'm not sure if they're happy about that or not, but education was always the ticket. And when we, came to learn that some kids in Layla's birth country didn't have those same opportunities. That felt like a place where we could contribute. And then Jane came into the picture because Jane, as, as she mentioned, has been doing this for years. So really helped us understand some of the things that we could do. And in 2016, we decided it was time to go out on our own. And this Ready, Set, Go book project, which is Jane's um, brainchild was the project that really got us excited because of the potential to have a huge impact, um, even though it was going to be really, really hard. So Open Hearts, Big Dreams as an organization was born out of the belief that if you open your hearts, both to give and to receive, right? It's for both sides. And you have big dreams, you know, wherever you are in the world, 
that those three things together can have a really giant impact. So this project, Ready, Set, Go Books, was the literacy anchor that we were looking for to, to bring this organization to start realizing the potential of, of collaboration and innovation for some of the world's hardest problems like literacy is. I was going to ask you, how did you come up with that title? But I think you just answered it uh, because open hearts, big dreams uh, by itself is so powerful. When you look at it, you want to know more about it and then how it is. So we all want to have that open heart to accept anything that's around us. And then having that big dream, that's the only way we can accomplish. We have to dream it first, visualize it, and then just go after it. And then this is why we are here. Uh, Leila, let me come to you. So how did you get involved or whenever your mom start talking about this project, what did you see in it and how did you jump in and um, what was your role in it? Well, when it comes to events, I'm definitely more of the spokesperson. Um, so like I speak at events, I love doing it because it helps me connect with people and tell them what we're about and what we believe. And yeah, that's, I, I obviously enjoy working with my mom. It's one of the best parts of this, of volunteering. Okay. And honestly, when she was very, very young and I started talking to her about her birth country and how the opportunities for the average kid in the, the U.S. versus the average kid in Ethiopia were very different, she at a very young age just told me that was unfair. Like, it's not fair that some kids get to learn to read and some kids don't. Some kids get to go to school and some kids don't. Some kids get to see themselves in books and some kids don't. And as a little kid, she just said, that's not fair and you need to fix it. And I think the beauty of young children is they don't get focused on that's too hard or that's too big. They see a problem and they look to the people in their life that they believe have the power to fix it. So part of this whole effort is that desire to help fix it. And she's been working with us since before she has memory. She, uh, and Jane can attest to this, she started helping us with appeals at events at three, because who can say no to a three-year-old, right? And her, her role has grown since. So, um, and it is a joy. It's, it's something that we get to do together, which is really, really special. I definitely. I mean, I can see that the bond that creates, like you said, you're taking the time to connect her back to where she was born. And then uh, you just mentioned the biggest thing whenever I talk, kids don't know, no. They just keep added and added. And then I think as we grow, one of the sad thing that we lose is just we try to comply what the world is and we stop asking the right questions. We start put, we stop pushing that envelope <laughs> as much exactly. as we can. So Leila, do not lose that one as much as you can. Keep pushing that envelope, keep asking that and then only see the possibilities. And then that's why we are here. Uh, let me come to Jane after this. I mean, just like Eleanor introduced um, there was something that you had a dream and then I just found out also you mm -hmm. had also be moved when you were like a child uh, to Ethiopia and then so tell us a little bit about what is Ready, Set, Go and how did you what were you thinking about it and then how do you connect it with Eleanor? Sure let me start with the moment when I had helped start a library for children in Addis Ababa and my brother and I were there and we saw all the children there and there were rooms full of books that had been shipped from the United States. So there were rooms full of colorful books. And then my brother, who can read uh, some Amharic, said to me, do you notice all the kids are lined up at a shelf, a little shelf that has books in local languages? So there were room full of books, but the ones they wanted to read were the ones they could read in their own local language. And I had then the realization that we were, we were doing a very good job by starting libraries, but unless there were books in local languages to put into the libraries, we really weren't going to be able to truly reach children with literacy unless they had books in their local languages. In 2016, I went to visit in Ethiopia and I traveled with some artists, some Ethiopian artists and some American artists. And we went all the way to Maji where I grew up, which is way down in the Southwest. 
And by the way, I visited places like Pokwo too. So I have a good feeling for the Anuak side of this conversation. But I grew up in another very rural part of Ethiopia. And these artists who were from Addis Ababa, the Ethiopian artists that were from Addis Ababa were amazed at how beautiful rural Ethiopia is. And so when we were sitting around in the evenings, I asked them to help me think about the illustration side of it because I'm a writer and I had already been experimenting with my Ethiopian American grandchildren to see if we could tell some very simple stories in writing. So I knew I could do the writing part of it. But to have good children's books that make you want to read, you need to have compelling illustration. And I wasn't sure how to bring in that part of it. So these American and Ethiopian artists brainstormed with me. And then we went, when we went back to Addis Ababa, they led a workshop and they had children doing illustrations. And then one of the artists digitized it all and created a prototype book. And then I said, wow, okay we can actually do this. The technology is there. So I love it. People that are here with the software side of things. I was like, that's a piece I don't really know, but that is it. Clearly we can do this as long as I can create words and find other writers, as long as we can find volunteers who will do the art, we can have it digitized. We can put it all together, but I still thought maybe we would just create one or two prototype books until I was having lunch with Eleanor. And she said, well, I'm getting ready to start my own nonprofit. And I think this would be a good project. And I said, absolutely, because I commit to the creative side of it. I commit to the writing, to finding illustrators, to getting it, to creating the books. That's my field. I write, I teach children's book writing. That's what I know. But the production and the distribution, that's another huge piece. I know I can't do it all. So I will commit to the creative side if you want Open Hearts Big Dreams to create to production and distribution. And that's when the teamwork started for all of this. I like that. I think uh, was what you just said, it leads me to the question to go to Obala from here uh, because uh, I can visualize when you just said about there were kids in the library, but they all congregated in that area where for a book uh, that they uh, can read in their own language. And Obala, that's something that doesn't even exist right now. It didn't exist for a long time. So I can see how you are attracted when Eleanor says, and then let's go, we got to jump at it. So if you can tell us your personal story on what, why we need to do this and how you ended up reaching to Jacob, I know you mentioned a little bit, so what does this mean to you? What does this project mean to you? Well, I, I will say this project mean everything to me because as a kid uh, growing up in Ethiopia, education was, was not a priority, especially in my region. Um, you have to reach a certain age so that you can go to school. And uh, those barriers, uh, school uh, will be built like something you have to walk like um, you know, one hour and 30 minutes. That's the closest one where, when I was growing uh, uh, up uh, in Ethiopia. And for something like that, the interest, you will not have the interest because as a kid, uh, someone who is maybe six or seven, you, you cannot walk like every day to a place that, you know, and then education become only for adults. You know, you have to wait maybe when you're 15 or you are 17 or something, sometimes you may not have that opportunity. So when I saw this, and uh, when uh, Helenor explained it to me and I saw those kids picking up the book, you know, they're, you know, they pick up a book uh, translated in uh, Hamaric and then in English and then uh, in um, uh, like a language, maybe in a far language, you know, those little things. And then I'm like, wow, if a new kid in Gambela can see a book like this and read it uh, in Anyuak and then translate in English, this is everything. And uh, and to be honest, this this is the first thing ever. And right away, my mind, I'm like, I need this. I need. I have so many questions in my head, but I'm like, don't push it too hard. She may say no, but uh, <laughs> Eleanor and our daughter, they they read my mind, you know, and, and I'm like. I want it in my heart, like I want to do it, but 
when I came back uh, from Washington, D.C., I was in the airplane and I was just thinking through, I'm like, I needed a kid in Gambela to have this. I want my daughter uh, to, when she become two or uh, or one year and a half, now she's starting reading A, B, C, D, but I'm trying to have her learn in my language too. So I want her to do it, but I lost the language uh, how to write. I can speak Anyuak, but I don't know how to write anymore because I grew up in exile. So, and I'm like, maybe one, friends of mine in Minnesota can help me or uh, someone in Ethiopia or someone in refugee camp. And uh, by then Jacob, he was not even here. He was in Ethiopia. He was visiting Ethiopia. And when he came back, I'm like, hey, Jacob, I have this idea. And um, I met uh, one of the cool ladies and a, and a daughter in Washington, <laughs> D.C. And uh, we have this. We can have a book. We can have a book in Anua, you know, translated in English. Children book, you know. And he's like, Obala, I've been working on something like that. I've been brainstorming, but I don't know where to go. And I'm like, come join me in my house. So he come over and we just sat down for almost three hours, you know, going back. And I'm like, his story and how he uh, see everything back home, like in right now in 2021, I'm like, dude, I'm going to connect you with Eleanor and uh, I hope you will be in. So it didn't took Jacob and I will have Jacob speak uh, from his personal life because things has changed now in Gabella. Even though there's a little bit of uh, education being spread all over like other villages, it is not how it looked like in my region. And especially the Anua, we are still behind. And uh, to have something like this even from, for those kids who are in America here, uh, like my daughter uh, who, she can learn how to speak, but she may not have the opportunity how to write, you know, and read in Anua. So I think this become one of the great opportunity and I will pass it on to Jacob so that he can touch a little bit on that. And this is why we are here. We are trying to preserve the language. We are trying to preserve the culture through uh, literacy. And, uh, and, and this is one thing that all of us, everyone in this group, one of those kids who grew up in America that can say, I have a country that I'm proud of. And when I go back, when I visit Ethiopia, I don't need a translator. I don't need anyone to tell me, hey, this is where to go when you wanna buy something. They have something in their hand that they can carry with them when they go home. They will just feel like, they are home, they are away from home. And now, you know, they can just use those experience and, uh, and through those books, this is, we are changing the world. And I just want to shout out to Eleanor and your team. You are changing everything. You're changing East Africa. And this work will not only stop in Ethiopia, it will go to Kenya, will go to Uganda, because as we speak today, not only Ethiopian watching this, not only Eritrean, uh, is everyone in East Africa. And very soon you will see a lot of contact everywhere. So I just want to say thank you. And I will pass it on to my brother Jacob so that he can share a little bit of his story too. And right. one thing Thank before J Jacob gets started, you, you're either read our mind or you're in our strategic plan because we just we just started Kiswahili. We're working on Lugandan because we had African friends that said, what about us? Right. Yep. Like <laughs> Our kids like those books, too. So, again, if we have a leader like the two of you that wants to work with us, that's all we need. And as you said, then let's go. But I want to turn it over to Jacob, who has an incredible story and has probably did a, a fastest launch of a new language with us. Um, so we're really proud to have him as a, as a partner and a collaborator. So um, I didn't let him sleep. I didn't let out. him sleep. So I didn't before I pass it on. I'm like, Jacob, you don't want to let me down because you can speak Amharic. You still can speak Amharic. You can write and uh, you can speak Anyuag. You can write. Don't let me down. This is the only way we can put uh, Gambela on the map. So, and, uh, and he'd be like, Obala, I have homework to do. I'm like, Jacob, okay, just do a sentence every two hour. And then every day you can do a sentence. So yeah, but I will pass it on to Jacob. I love, I love that story. So Jacob, let me come to you. Uh, before you start telling us any of this in English, I would love to hear an Ainuak language. Uh, what does it mean to be in here? So if you can say it in short, so that everybody, not only the language, we want to hear how it sounds too. 
so man be mete chmadu na ena kai kore na to na lai to command chana ka for project mar banya so i said that i'm so grateful to be here to talk about the aga project yeah so i want i want to start by thanking eleanor uh thank you so much for opening this opportunity for people like us and so like obama mentioned i went back to ethiopia this summer and what i saw was the exact things that i saw some years ago before coming to america so the i know people will sorry uh, jake like i think your bluetooth is not connecting properly would you be able oh. to use just the phone uh, maybe removing the that one and then i'll come back to you until you do that so once you're or is, unless it's ready let me see go ahead Go ahead and mute and see them. Let's hear if your sound comes better. Is it much better now? Yes, I think this may be a little bit better. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so like I said, I was in Ethiopia this past summer and what I saw in Ethiopia is pretty much the same thing uh, I, I saw uh, some years ago before coming to America. So the Anya people will live in the western part of Ethiopia. And I know most of you might not know us because Ethiopia is a very diverse uh, country. And the minority are not usually represented uh, within the Ethiopian media or the other things. So uh, to see someone like me, some people like ask me like, hey, are you from Ethiopia? Are you really sure from Ethiopia? Like, yeah. Because the Ethiopian we know are the people with lighter skin, but people are not familiar with people that looks like me. Uh, so our language is is uh, diminishing, is uh, is 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 going down in so many ways. So when I heard about this Obala sharing with me, uh, I was so excited because my experience growing up, I never had children books. Uh, in my language, I never read uh, any anything that represent my culture or my Anyak people uh, in Ethiopia. So, I, I, I of course had some Amharic and English uh, dictionaries or like some Amharic books, but to have a book in my language, uh, that is something that I never had in Ethiopia. So this projects is too personal to me. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so blessed to be a part of this working with Eleanor. And yeah, I, 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 just, I, just, I just hope that uh, there are more people like Eleanor, Eleanor or like there are more people uh, that uh, would, would try to uh, help those minority, those minority group who are uh, is struggling, uh, preserving their language and is struggling, uh, keeping their children uh, learn or like know their language. No, like thank you so much for that. And I actually want to shout out because actually Anuak language books are reaching our top sellers um, because of the outreach that both GCAP and Obala are doing. And one of the goals with the work with Open Hearts Big Dreams was really to be as inclusive as we possibly could, right? Inclusive of languages. We've translated to seven languages. Actually, a smaller language than Anuak, Dietzen in Manji, is also in some of the books. And we'd love to try and figure out how do we get to all 80 to 90, depending on which source you have, of all the beautiful languages of Ethiopia. But again, we believe that every kid has the right to learn to read. Every kid has the right to many, many, many books. And every kid has the right to see themselves, their first culture and their first language in books. So we're trying. Uh, and again, we can't do it without partners um, and without the leaders in those communities. So as long as they step forward and say, we want to do it, I think this is a perfect example of people working together and the power of collaboration. Because we can't do it without Obala and GCAP and they can't do it without us, but together we can do these incredible things. And 
we can preserve a language together, right? We can promote a culture together. And I think that power of coming together and trying new things is really what we want the organization to inspire others to do whatever it is that they believe they are called to do or what's important for their community. So GCAP, thanks for that, that, that focus on how do we support all the communities, not just the majority communities. And that's a challenge, but it's a challenge we're willing to take on. And I want to say also from the artistic side of things that yes, DZ, which is spoken down in Machi is a very small language. It was not even a written language until very recently. But because of our heart connection to Machi, we're getting some of the books into DZ. But we also have images of Machi because my sister does a nonprofit project there. And that's another thing I know is very important is in our books, in our Ready, Set, Go books, to have images that represent the, the big diversity of Ethiopia. So that's another challenge I will give to some of you that, that we need to have more pictures. We need to have photos and things like that from the Gambela and Pokwo area so that we're also sure that we're also showing the way of life in different parts of Ethiopia, right? The houses in different parts or the customs in different parts, the children in different parts. Um, and we're limited because we don't work with professional illustrators. So we're always struggling to get those illustrations. But it's one of my goals to have as much diversity as possible in the illustrations so that we will be sure that all the children can see their own lives in the pages, urban children, rural children from all parts of Ethiopia. Definitely. I love the way you said it. For me, growing up in Ethiopia, also, as much as I loved books, just the illustration part, especially. I love cartoons, but there will be some writings, but the pictures were like not really that attractive as a child. I went to a French school, so the difference that I'm getting, the kind of books that I'm getting, yeah, I love the way <clears throat> those designs and then uh, I want to add on this because what you just said earlier Eleanor I think with, even with my girls it was one of the things like we find like so many Cinderella movies and then they all have to, to have like more the lighter skin than the black skin that we had now so none of that representation ever existed so I like all those books that you have well I think we'll share the website and then start to show those so representation does matter for our kids because if they don't see themselves as able to accomplish those things, it definitely takes away. It's like, then that means I don't belong in that group. I'm not able to accomplish A, B, C, D. Um, just not to put it aside, one of the things, for example, when Obama was elected as president, it was not just like because he's black or anything like that, but a black kid looking at Obama and said, when you look at all the white president that came all before it, a black kid, could think it's like I can never be president because this is just preserved for only white people. So the Obama being president by itself was for anything else. It's just like it give that dream. It's like as a black person, I can also be a president. So it does have illustration books, Hollywood, and everything that we see in the movies. That's how kids play it. So we will talk a little bit more about those kind of things that affect how much the kids mind because everything that they see on the book and then. Black sometimes being presented just as a bad thing, and then the white skin would be presented as just a Cinderella that always being the queen, the, the princesses, and you don't see the black girls being the princesses, and, and it feels like I can never be that. So I really appreciate everything that you're talking about because for kids, that illustration part, the colorful part, and then being presented in those books means a lot. So I definitely appreciate that. So I know we have a new Tegista, I'll come to you. Let me just go through the process. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I know sometimes the background doesn't work properly. So Dr. Worko, let me come to you and then I'll go to Bethlehem. Uh, so with you, I know you mentioned it at the beginning. Why, were, why did you get involved or what do you mean this project means to kids or your involvement? What are you trying to get out of it or what, what message would you like to, for people to understand for being involved in this project? You muted. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, literacy is a very important weapon we have to give to ourselves potentials to grow to the maximum possible. It can be passed on to generations. 
In my time, my parents were not educated. They had not the luxury of reading or writing, but they knew the future belongs to one who is going to school to read and write. In my time, all villagers had to come to my house so that I can read their letter from distant relatives written, and I have to respond to. With that, I had been given the opportunity to excel. My mother used to tell us stories during night time. Those stories were very moving. For instance, one is Saint Yared. And she told me by word of mouth because she doesn't write. You see, that clicked when I joined to the Open Hearts Big Dreams. My mother used just words. Why don't I write it? I wrote that book. Jen and uh, uh, Eleanor helped a lot to do that. So now this is one of the best selling books. And I discovered I was a writer. <laughs> so with that, uh, I, I just realized that reading and literacy is very important to open up opportunities. Otherwise, you know, you go to school with gaps in words, for instance, if you don't read and write, then nobody expects you to excel. You have to have vocabularies. You have to have a reading culture. If you don't read, if you don't love it, you cannot learn. You just kill time. So Ethiopia has to do a lot in this regard so that it is young, population will be educated and fit to the workforce of today. Otherwise, the world is moving. It is changing. We should adapt very quickly. That is why I joined Open Health and the Big Dreams. And in fact, I wrote about eight books by now. And that is very essential because if it is Jen, who is an expert and writes it, people think it is because she is white because she is privileged. Now, when I write it, they know that, okay, we will be like work group. As I told you, I'm an ecologist, ecologist by training, but you know, there is a potential for every one of us to do something, to make a difference in this world. So uh, it is very important also the coloring and the artistic illustration. My best friend, Daniel Getahon from Canada, is doing it for free. I am impressed by, the, by that. In fact, one person commented, while well, these books are not about the content, it is about the illustrations. You see, because they are very attractive. Yes, the cheetah of long distance runners, yes. All of these were a very important additions to the literature so that people can start learning. We invest early in childhood education. Ethiopia is lagging very much. We have to move on. We should set a goal. By 2050, we should eliminate childhood illiteracy. I don't know whether uh, Eleanor accepts this proposal, but I know she doesn't get tired to do that. So with that, it was a very, very uh, important contribution. For instance, another guy, who is here, first grader, went to school with this book and told to his teacher, look, Yared composed his poems centuries ago before even Mozart and others were doing it. He, he was proud. So, you know, the human spirit would like a push. You have to push it. The potential is unlimited. Uh, so, in fact, to improve the quality of education at university levels, we must invest first at lower grades. That is what Open Health's Big Dreams is doing. It is creating an ecosystem where people are educated, where they are not left behind. All children must get this opportunity, and we are targeting that. So, uh, in Ethiopia, I was uh, there last uh, a few months and uh, ESAT's uh, program manager, one lady, 
she was she found these books and she was reading to her children and they liked it and she repeated for them at night so she asked me to explain about open hearts and the big dreams objectives and the missions i did on that you see people are discovering that we exist that is why we exist in the first place so i don't want to kill your time because i can talk for many hours but that is not the mission so i'm here in literacy and reading culture improvement because this very uh, nice people El eleanor and uh, uh, Jen are pushing me to contribute, and I'm happy to do that. Thank you. The other thing that work who has contributed is he has talked about his background. I don't know if this shows up the trees one. I don't know if you have that one, um, okay. but he has also written books about the importance of saving Ethiopia's trees and the ecology. So he's brought that side, which is another very important thing for children to learn about. Well, and I wanted to shout out to Worku, who is also Layla's M. Hart teacher. Um, he knew Layla loved Greek mythology, so he encouraged Layla and I to collaborate with him on Andromeda, the Ethiopian princess, to combine the Ethiopian and the Greek cultures. And this is a reclaiming story, because if you search for uh, Andromeda, she more often looks like me, which they blame the Greeks for putting her in marble, um, than her true Ethiopian origin. So we we are presenting the Ethiopian princess, but it's one of the things Worku has been able to do on connecting dots, knew Layla's love, knew this story, and we also have the Ethiopian Space Science Society and their technology site promoting this book in Ethiopia for their efforts because it focuses on astronomy because Andromeda is a constellation. So all these dots that get connected, you can see what you're doing here on the show is what this group likes to do. Um, and you can see the impact that it has when you do it. So Worku is a huge dot connector. And I think we'll talk to some of the folks in the second hour, including Tigist and his daughters about how that takes some other directions in addition to literacy into technology and leadership. But um, Worku is modest, so I want to definitely give him the shout out he deserves. I love, I love that, the way you put it, because I love anybody who connect the dots because we have so many be beautiful dots, but we don't take the time to look back and see who's working on what. And then the collaboration that you all had in here, it's an amazing collaboration uh, to bring into here. So Betelheim, let me come to you and um, I know you mentioned a little bit at the beginning, and if you can say why are you involved and what does this mean to you? Um, so I, I want to go back a little bit because I think hearing the stories it reminded me that maybe there's a little bit of part that I never even shared with Eleanor. Um, so when I was growing up, I was born in Addis. Uh, I was the privileged one that got an opportunity to go to a private school, right? And in eighth grade, wonderful friends of mine um, decided, hey, I think we can do more. I know we're eighth graders. We don't really, I mean, telling our parents, like we want to do something else. And what that was, was create a nonprofit as eighth graders in Addis Ababa. And we decided we're just going to raise funds. And the goal is to give our neighborhood kids down the street, there were students in public schools that didn't have books, that didn't have pencils or any writing utensils or lacked, you know, they would have to reuse over and over again the pages and everything. So we decided to raise money and every Friday we would collect money. And then with that money, we involved our teachers and our teachers were willing to help us. So they rented a van for us and would buy all these books, we would buy all these writing utensils and we'd go drop it off at um, these public schools, we knew that was lacking, right? That we are eighth graders, I don't know, like 13 year olds. And it meant a lot to us. We were in Addis trying to make a difference. Of course, life happened. I moved here, we all dispersed, but that idea never left me. And, but when we come to the language aspect, I also knew that Ethiopia was so diverse, but I only spoke one of the languages, even though my parents both my dad spoke Afanoromo or speaks Afanoromo and speaks Tigrinya, but I didn't have that opportunity because it was not available um, to, like it was not available across the board. And that always kind of made me feel a certain way. Like, why is that not available? Why can't I learn it? 
because we're learning French, we're learning Italian. Why are we not having a class in Tigrinya or Ainoak, which I never, <laughs> well, I would have loved to learn about that. And so all of that, as of course, I'm growing up here in the US, I'm thinking about all those things. What can I do? How can I get involved? How can I bring Ethiopia that has all these beautiful languages to their front door? And so my thought was, okay, I'm gonna finish my master's. I'm gonna get a job, I'm gonna work a little, work with kids. I did um, my minor in like early childhood development and all that. So I figured I'll just take my time and then I'll go back home and do something, bring languages to these mother tongues because I never understood why a dad and mom would speak, let's say Afanoromo, but in school they are only learning Amharic. Like I felt like they should also have the opportunity to learn in Afanoromo or in Tigrinya or Guraginya, like name it. We have so many languages, it's amazing, but we were not doing that. And I just felt like there is this big gap and someone has to try. And was I didn't think I would ever accomplish it, but I thought I could try, right? But then Eleanor came out of nowhere <laughs> and said, I'm doing this thing. And I said, what? <laughs> That's what I wanna do. And I figured instead of starting from scratch, why not join already existing amazing organization? And at that time, I was actually starting um, a Maharic virtual school for students in the US because that was important to me. I speak Amharic, my children speak Amharic, even though their dad is not Ethiopian. So why are we not teaching both, if the both parents are speaking Amharic, why are their kids not speaking it? Like I knew there was a place for me. So I figured I would join that direction, be a virtual Amharic teacher and then help Eleanor you know, fill in that gap. So, and I think that's what Eleanor is doing. She's filling in a gap, a, a huge gap, the diaspora. Like we can go grab any book, but we don't see a Maharic on it, right? We don't see our faces on it. We don't see our clothes on it. And that is so important. I've seen it with my kid, my daughter. She flips through the books in the evening. She can now read a Maharic. So she's reading her books. That, was, that would never have been possible unless I wrote it myself, right? So Eleanor, you've done, a, oh, I, can, I can't thank you enough for giving that gift to my daughter and my son now, who's trying to pick, pick up a few fidels here and there. Um, so that is, that is important. That was a huge gap and now it's getting filled. And now Tigrinya speakers and Afanoromo speakers and Ainyak speakers and other languages we're working on um, that is, that's what it is. It's really just making sure that a child sees themselves in the language because you can't learn the culture if you can't read it in a way because there's that tone that comes with it, right? And so she has been able to do that. And everyone who works on this project, I mean, thank you all for, because I think uh, the diaspora community is thankful, so. Definitely. I second that because when I saw the website and everything, that's why I wanted to connect with Eleanor. I myself, like I'm one of the privileged kid that grew up in Ethiopia. I went to a French school and in that French school system and that Bissau in the middle of the center of it, I did not learn how to read Amharic until fifth grade because they taught us everything in French. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I spoke Amharic, but I didn't read until fifth grade. That's the only time they introduced it in Amharic. So it's a lot of team that's going on right now that we're all trying to understand. So you're really connecting beautiful dots, Eleanor. So it's an amazing project that all of us wanted to get involved in. Um, so let me come to Betty and Faven. Uh, if you can tell us what your involvement is, why, what does this mean to you? Um, whoever yeah. is older can go first. <laughs> okay, I'm older, so I'll go first. <laughs> um, so again, my name is Bethlehem, um, and a little background about myself. So I graduated with a psychology and biology degree from Texas Tech University, and uh, my plan was to pursue nuclear pharmacy when I, uh, but I learned my true fashion was in computer science. So even at a young age, I remember my dad got my sister and I a small Toshiba laptop and us playing games on it all night and being super interested in what else we could do with that machine. Um, anyways, that passion that ignited all those years ago is the reason why I'm working in a field that's um, intriguing and exciting today. Um, I say all this to say, um, I think what you guys are doing is extremely commendable. 
Um, and me being a girl from East Africa, a place where not many kids have opportunities to, ch to chase their dreams and goals. I think it's very important, um, those of us who had a shot at education, make it our mission to make uh, a way for the coming generation. Um, uh, thank you for letting me speak. And if there's anything I can do uh, to help push the needle, um, help in any way I can, um, I'd be truly honored. Um, I'll also leave my LinkedIn in the chat. So please don't hesitate to reach out and connect with me and see if there's anything I can do to help this cause. Definitely. Nobody's going to let you go. So you're already volunteering <laughs> for it. <laughs> so this is exactly why we are here. So definitely you have a lot to give in and then to contribute. So uh, let me go to Faven then. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Faven again, and um, I am a software engineer. I graduated uh, from the University of Houston, actually in psychology as well, and pivoted into computer science. Um, after I took a couple of courses, but my um, interest in computer science, like Beth was saying, goes back to when we were kids. Um, we were um, lucky enough to be exposed to, um, you know, uh, computer literacy and uh, things like that in general at a young age, because like our dad, you know, he's always been um, an advocate for um, education for making sure that we were exposed to these things um, since we were very, very little. So we always had interests in it and we always felt comfortable um, using it. And so when, you know, when the time was right, we felt like we could, that was something we could take on, which is why I think that what you guys are doing is so important because uh, familiarity at a young age really helps um, kids feel like they can, you know, it's not some foreign concept that they can't approach and it makes it a lot, a lot more, it, it makes it feel achievable. And so that's what I, that's what I really appreciate about um, Open Hearts, Big Dreams. And um, yeah, so once we, once I pivoted into computer science, I was able to just, um, you know, just attack it and, um, you know, get my, my first role and kind of move up the you know the corporate ladder um if you will and yeah it's been it's been it's been a lot of fun and it's um it's it's, it's been great overall and if there's oh, like beth said if there's anything that we can do to contribute to this um you know we'll be happy to mentorship or or giving a couple of classes or kind of just being there to be an example for the kids uh to show them that you know we we did come here at like when we were 11 or 12 so we grew up in ethiopia you know to show them that it's, it's possible like we'll be you know more than happy to do that and i'm just very like, glad to be uh to be here and to be a part of it so thank you definitely which what you just said because that's the future of it because that connection that you just said, the mentorship that you'll be able to provide. And then this is another part of area that I've been very involved with. Um, boys sometimes may have better, bigger opportunities, especially in Ethiopia and then in Africa. Sure. And the yeah. girls, they have to get married at early age. Uh, all of those things that comes in with this. So if they are educated and able to support the family, sometimes just because they think like if they get them to get married as quickly as possible, the family has not, do not have to provide uh, for those girls anymore so that's a very team and uh, especially outside the cities that we see so you both of you and Leila being here and then speaking and that it speaks a lot to those girls back home to they be able to see oh I can be like that too so there is a lot of program that we can talk about because there is a youth mentorship that we can talk about and then I'll Absolutely. let both of you to get involved with definitely we'll be doing that. We've been talking so much about culture, preservation language. Uh, Obala and I have talked already. We're gonna be doing a whole show on Gambella uh, to make sure to understand what happened and then everything else, the preservation. Now that meeting Jacob, we're gonna add him to that project too because uh, the specific thing, Ethiopia has almost 80 different distinct um, the cultures that we sometimes don't talk about. And uh, we need to be able to bring that up. And that's what makes us beautiful also at the same time with everything that's going around in our country right now. Also, I needed people to really understand education. That's where we are lacking. If our mindset change, our possibilities change, and if we can dream big, we'll be fighting less and less. So that's exactly what I, my goal is and everything else. So if we say, let's read instead of fighting, Let's use our words instead of fighting. We can get in so many places, sitting at a table and discussing what the possibilities, the big dream about open your heart to understand every single culture. 
this title means a lot to me just to reading it, Eleanor. So it's a lot. We have a new guest that we didn't introduce at the beginning to guest. Uh, so let me come to you. And if you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, and can I just do a quick, because one, Fevin in Bethlehem did a great job. We actually at Open Hearts have sort of two, two big pillars. One is around literacy and one around is around innovation and leadership. And that piece is much more around young people, young people at that stage where they're figuring out how to contribute to their community, to support themselves. So we do computer science classes. We've done girls coding camps. We'll talk, Ezra will join us and talk a little bit about that. Work who has been leading some of those efforts and Tigist is I think a perfect example of um, the role so, models we would yeah, like to present. Who has been leading some of those efforts and Tigist is I think a perfect Someone example the, of, oh. of the role so, models. Ezra, I think you may have uh, two phones or something connected. No, I, had, I had my computer on okay. if, and if you can flip your oh. landscape for your phone that'll be good I, I, I don't know if i can do there I, you go that's better and okay. so eleanor those of us who are the literacy people i as, i assume you are excusing us so that the leadership people can now take over is that true i <laughs> am so one yeah. i want to extend a huge thank you to bethlehem jane obala and gcap for joining us Lots more work to be done, and I think probably more shows in the future about all the big, big, big dreams, because we, our dreams get as big as it gets, and I think you heard from all of them, um, but thank you for that, and yes, Jane, until next time, which is probably tomorrow, and uh, Obala and Chikap, <laughs> probably equally soon, and thank you, Bethlehem. You don't have to leave it. Whoever can stay can you stay, You can too. stay, yes. You're yeah. welcome. I have one last you thing around. to shout out. Um, may, may I get two seconds? Yeah, of course. Go ahead. Okay, I want to read this quote uh, by uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, he's, uh, he said, if you talk to a man in a language he understand, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his own language, that goes to his heart. And uh, the reason why I picked this quote is to see uh, is how I felt about how this uh, project connecting Ethiopian. And uh, when we look, as we can see right now on this screen, we have more than uh, five languages. And uh, through this project, I can see a kid in Tigray and can learn how to speak Anyuak without even visiting Gambela. And uh, when he or she visit Gambela, he will speak in a language that uh, the Anyuak people uh, will feel like, how did you know? And that will create more connection. And a kid in, um, in Amara, a kid in Afar can pick a book uh, uh, in Romo that they can, I wanna learn about them. Because if we teach our kid at early young age about uh, how beautiful we are, how about other, our neighboring, our you know, other region in Ethiopia, they have such a beautiful culture. If they learn from young age, that thing will not go away from them. And uh, we are not, we, we, we will not, even if when they grow up, uh, someone will go and be like, okay, I don't want you to speak uh, any uh, Amharic, or I don't want you to speak any Romo, or I don't want you to speak Hanyu. It's already stuck in his head and no one can take that away. And I just wanna say this, as you continue through this journey, let's remember those kids in, uh, in rural areas that they don't have all those opportunities. And what we are doing here in Western world here, we are trying to connect them because all of us cannot be present in every corner in Ethiopia. And all of us cannot be in Washington, Seattle or in, in California. So I just want you to start speaking to your kid and tell them that Ethiopia is so beautiful, but it's beautiful because of you and because of your friend that's sitting over that corner. And this is the way to learn. Go and buy that book in different language and teach them how to know more about Gambela National Park or uh, about Lalibaba or about any other thing that going on in Ethiopia. I think this is a true changing. And I can't wait to have a ton of book goes to Gambela and those kids can sit down and feel so proud and be like, wow, I can have this at this young age. Because me, I start 
going to school when I was 11. And I did not have that opportunity when I was in Ethiopia until I went to refugee camp in Kenya. And so many kids, like I was in class with kids who are like uh, nine, they beat me every day because I can't spell any word because they already started at a young age. So I think we're changing world and uh, this is just starting and looking forward to see more. Thank you again. And look what I you have, have accomplished, to... Obala. And where you are right now, you are a city council and speaking in and then teaching all of that. So from everything that you came, that big dream that you had, that big heart that you have, it brought you in where you are now speaking back, not only to represent yourself, but for all of us to be able to say how proud we are of everything that you have accomplished and what you're going to accomplish. So this is just the beginning of it. So a lot, a lot to learn. So we do have a guest too. Two Can of I give you one last plug before I leave as well? I have one thing to say. But <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me give my plug and then I will run. So I just saw the Vincent Van Gogh um, exhibit this morning that maybe some of you have seen that's traveling around the country. And he said in his writing that artists are the lowest of the low. Really, most artists do not make money. They are a low part of society, but what we have that we are rich in is our ability to share our words and our pictures. So I wanna give a plug that we, we need to represent more of Ethiopia as well. And we can't do it without the illustrators that will come on and volunteer their talent. So the last thing I'll say before I leave is for the con parts of the country like Gambela, like Maji, like every part of beautiful Ethiopia, we need to have more illustration that will help us show every part of it. So if some of you know talented illustrators, please tell, please send them my way to the creative team because we we really, that's that for the future, that is my goal to have even more diverse illustration that can show every part of Ethiopia. So that's my last word. Thank you. Oh, Jane, Thank you. before Jane leaves, I wanna say I'm your fan. Uh, thank you to you because of you my son has uh, Amharic language books um, I just want to say before you leave that my husband came home the other day and found like a mountain of books and he said oh my god what did you do and I said well they're in Amharic so I need to get them for our son okay also, before I leave, I just want to, Yofte, again, thank you so much for this platform. And you and Obala both mentioned on how a language can really be the peacemaker in all of our industries. And this has been something as a child, Eleanor was mentioning, her daughter was like, I can do this. That was me. I never thought though it was going to be possible until I met Eleanor. And I, I'm very passionate about Ethiopia and I want the peace right we all want peace but in order to get there we have to love each other and that means we have to love each other's language each other's food each other's clothes but how would we do that if we don't have these books or these resources to teach us about each other and once we know about each other there's no way we're going to hate each other because we are all amazing and that is what i want to say we just need to learn about each other and appreciate each other so we can go forward peacefully. And that's all I wanna say, thank you. This book, I mean, I'm just gonna to add to all of you uh, first guests before leaving. It's about, ex I exist, you can see me, you can feel me because we did it in songs uh, because everything but knows of gragging a comes, it doesn't matter if you can hear it or not, you understand the word, you know how to dance gragging and no matter what, <laughs> the green yak comes up and any kind of things that come in. So. This is an addition to it that I've been missing the link in Ethiopia that I see because songs have a powerful way of connecting us. And now the books, just like Obala said, someone doesn't have to be in Gambela to be able to understand Ainuk and be able to read it. So I love that. It's a peacemaker and then understanding the language. We are all willing to learn English. Why not any other languages? Yep. Especially when it comes to us that says, belong to me, it comes from me. So this is definitely a very powerful way uh, to be able to understand it. So whoever was in the first guest, if you have to leave, I understand. If you want to stay with us, you can stay, but we'll connect. There are more and more things to do. And then I would like all of you to get involved, especially with the program that we're going to do about Gambella and not just Gambella, but we have a program that's going to be called in the Tuawik. Let's get to know about each other. The little thing that's in it. So we'll add from Amara region, from Tigray region, from Guragi region, 
because the little things when to get married, how what does it mean getting married? What does it look the ceremony looks like it? What does the food look at it? Those little things, if we keep adding them every single day, just like Betelim said, there is no need to hate each other because what we don't know, that's what we hate. That's what we don't know, not even hate. First, we fear it because we don't even understand it. And then that fear turns in whoever we're hearing it from into some kind of hate or avoidance. So we will get to it slow by slow. We know what the answer is. And these are the dots that need to be connected to be able to get to it. So I appreciate all of you, not only for what you're doing here and what you have also accomplished personally in your thing. So we will talk personally because I did not give you a platform to talk more about your own thing, what you do in your life. You have my email, please reach out to me. And then uh, there are a lot that we can discuss, especially the girls, the women's, we need you. I'm going to say that the voice is not being heard. So don't go away. I know we tell him and Faven, we think this is the last time they're going to hear from me, but I'm going to surprise you. So <laughs> we have a project that we're going to be talking about. And then I'm all ears for any kind of project that we need to talk about. Because we, we should be afraid about what we're not talking about. Because what we're talking about, we can find solution with it. So I appreciate all of you for all of that. Uh, if you can stay, stay. But if you want to leave, leave. I think I'm going to go then to Tigis. I interrupted you quickly that you're going to introduce. And then I'll go to Ari to introduce herself. And I'll go to Ezra after that. So thank you, everyone. And uh, let me go to Tigis then. Hi, can you can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so my name is Tigis, and I was born and raised in Bahadar, Ethiopia. Actually, I finished uh, high school there. Uh, in my time, it calls a preparatory school or preparatory school. And then I moved here about 10, 11 years ago. And I went to school here, major in chemistry, pre-med and graduate here. So I'm currently working as a clean, uh, medical laboratory technologist or clinical laboratory scientist. Um, <laughs> I joined Open Heart Big Dreams when um, I saw, the uh, first time I saw um, Eleanor uh, publishing on LinkedIn, like she usually uh, publish articles and then post it on uh, LinkedIn. And I'm always advocating um, education because I know I grew up in that education system. And I also went to school here and I kind of know the difference between my country and uh, American education system. Uh, so I'm always advocating a stronger education system back home. Um, so once I saw her publishing in her and I reach out to her, I think I commented one time and I think uh, one time, and then she sent me her uh, pri uh, private contact number. We talked it, and um, uh, after that, I joined in. I am grateful for the fact that she let me join in uh, because this is my passion. So I um, translate the STEM, mainly in chemistry, a little bit of uh, bio. After that, um, I guess I was accepted in. <laughs> and, and since then, here I am. And whenever they give me an assignment, I try to translate into my Amharic, and that's what I speak. I also, because my dad from uh, Tigray region, uh, he speaks to me in Tigray. Um, I'm not fluent, but I can understand uh, the, uh, the conversation. Uh, I wish I learned more language, but we will overcome this as we work together with diverse um, um, language of my uh, people. <laughs> so uh, here I am <laughs> and happy to be here. And hopefully we will do more and more um, as we advance and as we progress in our work. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Let me go to Ari and then Ezra. Ari, I know... Uh, uh, when you and I talked about it right away, you just said, I love uh, open hearts, big dreams. So tell us a little bit so that because these are the people who have been creating in the background, working on it, what kind of impact did it have? So if you can share that for all of them. I wanted all of them to hear before they left, but they didn't get opportunity. They'll hear it in the recording. 
Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on, letting me meet all of you really great people. Um, I So right now, uh, me and my husband, Biniam, we're living in the U.S. We hope to, in the long run, be back and forth between Ethiopia and, and the U.S., but for practical reasons, we have to be here right now. And um, my so my son, he just turned two on Thursday, I think it was. So my immediate concern, like when thinking, oh, he's not going to live in Ethiopia, is like, is he going to learn Amharic? You know, because for me, I understand that um, it's just so important to your identity. Like he, he's his father's Ethiopian, but also he's born in Ethiopia. He spent before coming here most of his life in Ethiopia. So. Um, it just feels like it would be just such a, a horrible loss to, um, you know, to lose something that, you know, language is so personal, language is so important. So that's why I was saying that I was so excited when you mentioned Open Hearts, Big Dreams. Uh, oh, yeah, I said, um, oh my God, this, you know, this is the organization that I basically have every single book, like I bought them all. I was like, I need all of these books. <laughs> To read, to learn how hard for myself or my son. Yeah, you even have some of our brand new ones. Like the the National yeah. Park is like a just a newly published one. And yeah, Andromeda I is Layla and I in Worku. So this is the three of us are the authors of this one. And do you have to story for this is a that reclaiming of an Ethiopian princess. So we love to see that in your pile. Yeah, I really didn't expect to uh, after buying the books to meet the the authors, but I'm I'm very I started following on Instagram right away. Um, that's usually my way of supporting, but um, I'm very I'm I'm very thrilled right now that I, I got the chance to interact with you. And I want to say thank you because um, you know this is an actually an issue I have with uh, so with Vinny and my husband. I tell him you know kids can learn a million languages at one time. They are sponges; they can soak it up. But I think he's learned that uh, someone had told him a long time ago, oh, you know, they learn one language at a time. So it's kind of in a back and forth where I'm like, no, like you speak Amharic and I will take care of, you know, I speak Spanish. I'll speak to him in Spanish, whatever other language, you know, I put on uh, uh, cartoons in Oromo, Tigrinya, everything. I want him to soak it all up. I want him to get everything. So I'm very passionate about this subject. Awesome. Thank, thank you, Ari. I know you're going to be a big promoter. And then I love it because this is exactly who is it reaching. That's what I wanted to say, Eleanor. Sometimes we think we're just reaching only the people in Ethiopia that don't need it. But the kind of uh, Ari and Biniam who are migrating in, uh, in the US and then even for my kids, like even though they are not little anymore, but just this is something that when you look at it and says, hey, I belong here. This is me in another way. So that's definitely beautiful to see. Ezra, if you can Hi. introduce yourself a little bit, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, I just hear make you. sure if my Bluetooth is okay. Um, I'm a little bit under the weather. So I'm just recovering from a little bit of a flu. Uh, thankfully, it's not COVID, but it's a, it's a, it's a distraction. And then, Nevertheless, by itself, you know, even a flu. So yeah, so I'm gonna be a little bit uh, unconventional, as as I as I'm always unconventional. So I'm gonna go a little bit in a different direction. Then in terms of my introduction, somebody. So I'm so I I am a passionate educator, builder, creator, change maker, uh, a humanist seeking to uh, to find meaningful and fulfilling uh, pursuit in my life. That will allow me to be a fully expressed human being. Uh, that is what defines who I am, and and I'm somebody who believes that you know the the human life uh, it is one of purpose and meaning. And why do I say that? I want to read you something that really connects with me, from somebody who's very important. It's a quote for me, so I've switched up a little uh, my app here. I'm using my iPhone, so bear with me. Uh, if you can't hear me, just let me know. But it says yeah, yeah. here, yeah, he says here. So Paulo Freire, who wrote the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he, he writes somewhere in the middle of one of the contents is very relevant to me and speaks to the part about my belief in the purpose and meaning, a life of purpose and meaning. He says the difference between animals who, uh, because of their activity, does not constitute the limit act, that does not constitute limit act, cannot create product detached from themselves and humankind 
who through their action upon the world creates the realm of culture and history is only the latter a being of the praxis. I mean, the, the term praxis he uses frequently throughout uh, his uh, book is essentially means it's a, a being of practice, being of action. That's what it means. So to me, I want to be that difference. To me, that's like meaning of purpose. The purpose is to create something, to create culture, to create history that others, other, other animals may not have. They might have, but we don't have a way of knowing now at the moment. You know, trees create history. Uh, animals, some, uh, some way create history. Sometimes the fossil world is, is part of history. So to some extent, you know, uh, Paulo Freire might be a little bit simplistic on that, but I can say this, like, you know, in, in the living human beings, uh, you know, we are of uh, meaning and purpose. So for me, at uh, Open Heart Big Dream, um, I get to exercise this quality, this personality. I get, to, I get to have a platform to do that. I haven't done uh, as well as I could because of a different you know, phase of my life where I have to grow and change and transform. And, and, uh, and, and Eleanor has been the most patient person I've ever had to work with, with that. And she, she knows what I'm talking about. But that said, you know, the, the, the goal, my vision doesn't change, which is, you know, I see my, so I, I, I want to exercise that humanity in me and continue to be, to fulfill a purposeful or meaningful uh, life. But that has a vision in it. The vision in it is that it's based on my experience is, is uh, to bring to the world an education, an education practice, not theory, not concept, but an education practice that liberates, empowers, uh, and set humanity to a, a full expression, to a path of full expression. I don't know if that's more than enough, but if there are questions about specifics of what studies I've done, what those things, I, I'm, I'm willing to, and, to entertain and, and discuss that. But uh, that pretty much sums up who I am. Good. And I'm glad, and, and all of this that you just described, like it shows who, why you got involved in here. I mean, we talk about the big change that we big dreams we're talking about. And then in everything that you said, I heard so many times the change part, the grow yes. part. So this is why we are. And then it definitely in the transformation that we all need because by learning, by reading the books, by getting involved, the STEM that we're talking about and everything else, that's how we grow and that's how we change uh, yeah. with everything that we learned. So you described you. it in all of those and then why you are is Eleanor. Uh, so now that we are part of the second part of it, where we're talking about innovation leadership and all that, uh, let me bring it back again to Eleanor. So what do you think this part is covering? Uh, what makes it different from uh, set, uh, Ready, Set, Go? What is, this, uh, what is this part of the project is? Perfect. So we really wanted to look for white space opportunities in places that we could have a giant impact. So the pillars that we work around are literacy. Literacy is that first gate. You don't get literate, Dr. Worku explained well, so many other educational gates are closed, but we need leadership. When you look at the challenges around the world, we need servant leaders. We need those who want to contribute to their communities, to their culture, to the globe. Like I believe we're all part of the human race and we're all global citizens and we need to raise leaders who think like that. So our other pillars are leadership, Innovation, which includes technology, but innovation for me is as simple as trying something new. Our literacy project is innovative because we were crazy enough to say we regular people can create a library's full of books in a culture and languages that we don't necessarily speak ourselves if we bring communities together. So innovation is really about trying new things. I love the quote, the definition of insanity is trying the same thing and expecting a different result. So we're at least trying different things. And our, our other pillars are inclusion and we definitely focus on gender inclusion particularly. So you'll see strong women in every part of what we do or strong women to be um, because we think that role models as you talked about are so critically important. So like you can see our role models here or on the other 
So leadership inclusion, but also inclusion of people with disabilities. And we realized actually when we got a big grant from a personal friend to focus on children with disabilities in Ethiopia that we were not inclusive in that because it wasn't our lived experience. So we managed to publish a hundred books and run a lot of classes without ever considering that lived experience. So we're focusing on inclusion and then leadership is really something that gets woven through. So in our innovation section, we have a couple things that we're doing. And again, all experiments and pilots. Ezra is very modest, just like Dr. Roku. Ezra ran our first girls coding camp with the, high, the very innovative high school, Labawi and Addis, and we had a great experience. It was our first try at doing computer science in a different way over summer school and focusing just on young women. So we've extended that and we're now running virtual computer science classes for students in Dredua, Jima, and Bahadar. And, you know, through conflict, through COVID, they show up. Ezra leads at work who works on it too every Saturday morning um, for us and evening for them. And then we're trying to support innovative teachers and work who will talk a little bit about that. But just like the books was a revelation to us, the lack of books or this lack of that opportunity to see yourself in books, teachers don't get resources, right? You get, my parents are teachers. When you graduate from college, you get to take your textbook. My husband is a calculus teacher. We have textbooks that I keep telling him, how many do you need? We can donate some of those. But I was talking to teachers in Ethiopia, they don't get to take their books. And there's no continuing education if you want to continue to grow your skills. So we found this very innovative teacher in Dangla, his name is Tawaba. He met Worku and Worku can build trust with people like nobody knows and Ezra and, and Tigus can nod on that. because uh, And if Dr. Worku asks one of his mentors to do something, they do it or if he builds trust, people will people will do whatever he asks, right? Because he comes from this place of service. But Tawaba gave Worku all of his life's work, chemistry, physics, and biology, and what we've been working on, and I will let Tigist and, and Dr. Worku talk about that, is starting to create some of these resources for teachers. Um, so our goal is really how do we empower teachers and how do we empower young people with the tools and the leadership to lead us to a better place because the generation that I am at has led us here and we need to get to a better place. So we need to take that next generation and give them the tools to fully realize their humanity as Ezra. And then what do you do with it? You live a life of purpose, but if you want a life of purpose, you still need opportunities, you still need tools, you still need education. So that was a very long answer, but this is a very innovative space where we try different things and it's not just one project. Okay, thank you. Leila, anything you wanna add with what your mom said? What does this mean to you? Especially we mentioned so many times the younger generation taking over at some point. So how are you preparing yourself or what does it mean from what she just said? Well, we joke about how much she enjoys the technology that gets created by the computer scientists. So, um, uh, so she should at least give back for that usage, right? But, um, but no, I mean, why don't you talk about that? I mean, I think part of it gets down to opportunities too and her realization of some of the opportunities and why do you share them that you get to study and learn about things here that aren't necessarily available to kids your age in Ethiopia like your computer science class? Oh, or... <laughs> yeah, I took a computer science class um, in my sixth grade year and my seventh grade year for my first trimester. And I loved my teacher and I loved learning about it and like watching the stuff that I created go onto the screen. And I feel like everyone should be able to experience what I felt when I realized that I could create so many more things. Yeah, I remember when her first coding thing actually worked, it was like everyone in the house, come over, come over, come over. And like that power of coding to actually make something happen. And for our students too, just like we've talked with Layla, that doesn't mean everyone needs to be a computer scientist. Everyone needs to understand how technology and science works. And then they find their unique calling, which could be the ecology, you know, 
saving, you know, the planet, which is, you know, Dr. Worker is going to help us. And it may be chemistry like Tigist is helping us on, or, you know, we have entrepreneurs and innovators like Ariel, like there's just lots of different ways, but understanding how everything works and where that power comes from is really, really important. So part of it was how do we replicate some of those opportunities being a teeny tiny organization that doesn't have giant funding. So what are the things we could do? Love that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let me come to Dr. Worko then. Um, um, anything that you want to add on or details that you want to give us was what Eleanor just mentioned right now, how that's an innovation, the leadership, and then like she said, the technology part uh, plays in all of this. You're muted. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Eleanor has uh, defined innovation, and uh, that is a relief because it, defining innovation is a bit uh, tricky. However, it is just uh, as she put it, it is to do things in a different way. It doesn't have to be an original invention. If you bring tools together and try to solve any problem, then that is innovation. That is. I think it is from that angle we are trying model projects around Ethiopia. Uh, so uh, the, in the computer class, uh, again, I had a passion for this because when I was in Belgium, I was studying in Belgium, uh, I, many people bought an old car and imported to Ethiopia. But I refused to do that. Instead, I bought the first desktop computer with the first windows it was windows 4 or something it, it was in 1991 and then i started training my brothers in fact i programmed the first turbo pascal programming language at that moment and my my brothers quickly catch up but i didn't and then both of them now work at Microsoft. It is one of, it is these two people who started classes for Ethiopian students. Yirga in particular, helped us to win the hearts of American embassy, American corner. They have a very amazing teaching facilities. And when we try to do something, they saw that and they gave us. And in fact, we also, got a very modest grant and we are running, Ezra is the leading here. Uh, so, and Ezra has a lot of uh, followers, so students, they are amazing. And uh, Jonas, for instance, was mentioning, and, and, and others. So with this, we are giving the opportunity Ethiopian students to see themselves in Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. And because when they see these people, they say, okay, I can do it. That mental, that mindset is critical. Uh, in Ethiopia, uh, the digital gap is again huge. We should not be left out from that kind of development. So computer literacy is one way by which we can give tools for our kids so that they can co-create their own future. Uh, and uh, when we see um, books, these STEAM books, some call them STEM, some STEAM because art is included there. Uh, again, in the Dangila project, as mentioned by Eleanor, I met that kind-hearted guy called Tawaba. He is very intelligent person working in the areas of Dangala. He does all laboratory experiments from locally available materials. He doesn't need very expensive reagents. He synthesizes it just from normal grass, ordinary grasses. And he just used magnets from all the radios and developed a motor that runs perfectly. So that had attracted me because I think uh, uh, Eleanor was also attracted and they, they, we built a 
science library, science laboratory. And then we wanted to produce books. I convinced him we should write this and pass it on to other generation. So he, he trusted me. And now we are almost completed, completing biology, chemistry, and physics. It is a very important book where people will learn not only from our skills, also from our mistakes as well. We are not writers, but we develop that. Then they can improve it over time. And Ethiopian kids will have the best uh, teaching aids. The Ethiopian teachers, in particular, the best teaching aids for uh, children. Uh, therefore, uh, I see that uh, we have to help our young people. It is not about us who are aging, but Ethiopia needs young people to take over. But if they are ill prepared and cannot compete in the international world, you see what we see now is the price we are going to pay. So teaching should involve at early age, middle age, and universities. We are entering in various points. You see by writing children's book at the lower grade and these STEM books at the middle. Doing this, open hearts and big dreams is fantastic. And many people are trusting it. And my hope is, because I said we are aging, Leila will take over this project. That is what I ask you. <laughs> and take it to the next level. And Ethiopian girls will have chance the way she had it. So I think it is a very important undertaking. I'm happy. It, is, it doesn't mean I don't have my own personal life, but Eleanor is a pusher. She pushed me <laughs> to do it. And, I had no plan to write 10 books, but every time the next phase is again another challenge. Therefore, I really am happy. And my, my, my wife is also supporting me for this because she's impressed by what I'm doing and I'm happy with that. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm sure uh, there are many people coming forward to help this cause because you know, you have to, we depend on uh, free, free labor, that is volunteers. The volunteers, many things are free. And the volunteers, in fact, I will suggest to Eleanor in the future, tour and teach project also we should consider because many Ethiopians are going back to Ethiopia. By, by flying, you know, climate change is affected by flying. Therefore, you should compensate that by doing very important jobs while you are in Ethiopia. So we must think about this project in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. I agree with you. Um, before I go on to Tigist and Ezra, because I know Ari, you're here and I don't have to keep you in here so I can honor your time. Any questions that you want to ask to any of them while you are here? Oh, are you speaking specifically to me? Yes. Any okay. questions? I mean, this is a, if you can ask directly or any question that you may have, then I'll go to Tigist and Ezra because uh, I know you had to come in from another Zoom and to say hello. Oh, yes, so I, was on I wanted to make sure to honor Very your time long. too. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I had, I wanted to just hear a little bit more, uh, you know, about like I had read, I read up on, in, in the books how the project started and everything. I, I do have one question though. When Jane was leaving, she um, mentioned that it, uh, that she's always looking for illustrators. Uh, is that anyone who wants to volunteer volunteer their time to illustrate, or is that Ethiopian illustrators? Or no, and I am so glad you asked that question because we want any illustrators, any illustrators. And we have worked with a range, right? So, and I think Ariel, it's one of the funnest things about the project. We have little kids who like have an art teacher who works with them to create just really cool art because kids love other kids' arts. We also have a 
group in Oregon that Jane was connected to and one of our other artists, basically it was senior citizens taking art classes, white senior citizens, looking at photos of Ethiopia and creating beautiful, beautiful art. I'm gonna see if I have one here, like the Great Rift Valley was produced by people who probably had never, you know, set foot, you know, in Africa or even in Ethiopia, but from photos. So we have that opportunity for anyone. Most of us are amateur artists. They can actually help us with an entire book, which is 11, we call them spreads. Or if they're a professional artist or anyone in between, we can work with all of them. And we also have some artists, like he mentioned, Daniel Getahoon, who's done, he did Andromeda, which was art he did specifically for us. But he also has let us use his whole portfolio of art. Just basically, if you want to use any of my art for photos, you can. So Ariel, anyone who has that creative heart and wants to work with us, the only rule we have, and we only have one, um, is it has to be something that a kid in Ethiopia would feel connected to. And again, the diversity of Ethiopia, doesn't matter if it's the far South or the West or the, and we're constantly looking to make sure our diversity is as great as the diversity of the country. But we had actually, it was an Ethiopian American who had a story about snow. Well, if you travel to Ethiopia, there's not really much snow unless maybe you go high in the mountains. So, you know, yeah. no snow, no non-indigenous animals, not people that look like us unless somehow they are fit in the story. Um, but yes, it's open to any and all artists and we will yeah. work with them. Well, no, yeah, there, well, I wanted to say that um, like uh, so many people reach out to me uh, through my social media and say, you know, hey, I really want to, um, I see you're doing some project for Ethiopia, like I want to do something uh obviously people some people just like if i'm doing a fundraiser they just want to contribute money but a lot of people either can't or don't trust that you know money necessarily always gets to where it's supposed to go so i've had people um i've had one woman be like i knit that my favorite like i knit could i do something to like you know for ethiopia like with my knitting and i was like well i don't know but um you know i would i'll have to talk to someone who knows about that but illustrate um if you're looking for illustrators i'm sure i can find you very enthusiastic illustrators well and it gets to ezra's per point about life with purpose what we're finding is it gives art purpose right so you're not just creating art in an art class. Your art is actually going to delight some kid who may be reading their first book or their fifth book or getting to see themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have found our artists are finding just their gift is a gift that gives back. And even Daniel Getahoon, we are so honored by him. So I said, we print in, we print in Udis now. So our books are available there. So I asked him, I said, I want to donate some of your books and the rest of the books to some place in Ethiopia to say thank you, because that I, I felt like that might be a good way to honor him. And he has a brother in Addis who just picked up a set of books. So um, and in Addis, it's only two dollars a book. So it's much easier for us to, to get books out. But yes, if there's people who have that heart for art, it's a beautiful thing. And I think you heard on the first hour the writing is so important and you don't have good kids books without good writing, but the writing part isn't the part that people remember. They remember the illustrations, right? And that, you know, that color and the, you know, the landscape. So thank you for that. Yeah, I have something here, a little bit. Sorry, uh, no, you've given me a new mission to work on this week, so. Ah, yes, uh, I give yeah. people missions as you talk to, like, yeah, you now have yours. You are you are on a mission to find us new illustrators. So yes, uh, you are now officially part of the team and you don't ever get to leave the team. Uh, <laughs> you have these rules, right? Um, but you only but if have- If I come to with like 10, 10 illustrators or like 20 illustrators, they'll be like, oh, God, that's you. No, we will make it work. We will make it work. No, the only rule for anyone on the team is that everything you do with us gives you joy. There you go. So, uh, can, right. can I add a joyfully, bit, and you're I, on the team. Ezra, go. Can I add a little, I yeah, it, so uh, I think there's like, you know, there's a lot of identity. She talked about knitting. Growing up, I, I saw my family knitting stuff. And then I don't know if you know Safed. I don't know what the Safed is in Amharic and English, but like, you know, like uh, when you did the injura part where straw. you covered the injura, yes. Ari? Yeah, straw. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's called 
a straw based kind of uh, art. So like you the, see them. Like the loom? I don't know if it's loom. Is, is it a loom? I don't know. I'm not family, is but it something weaving? like. With, it's a type of weaving, but you're weaving straws. Some of them are. So when you go to Ethiopian restaurants, you see this, um, like, you know, decoration for eating meals together. Those yeah. things that you see in some restaurants, you see those things. You know, if you go you to know, the, me the mess up where in Jara, they put in Jara on. Yeah, I've yeah, seen, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. you use it on it. So that's yeah. what it's talking about. You go to let's say Gragi areas, and I, which I had a pleasure of visiting homes, just normal ordinary homes where the walls are decorated with all sort of agil and that kind of thing. So craftsmanship is an essential essential component of African life. So one of the things beside uh, open heart, if you have people who likes weaving, okay, I will teach you how to weave unique qualities. You will teach me how to do strokes. So you create, you take away the barriers of, oh, I'm not, I'm coming to help you have a better life. No, you, I'm coming to learn from you and then, you, and then I'm going to teach you something that I know. So yeah, that kind of right community idea. is the kind of thing that's highly needed in collaboration between people on this side and people on the other side, which is always neglected. And I, I mean, for an Ethiopian, these things are normal things from the, uh, the coffee pot that we have, the craftsmanship that goes into it, from the cines to the s s like all these things that people use. People use it not just for injera; they use it to see through. Uh, like you know, if you have lentils, you're preparing lentils in Ethiopia, and then you take it from a farm, you're preparing lentils. There's a way you use that that uh, that lent that uh, tray thing to really separate between the the good from the bad. There's an all sort of even colloquials and that kind of things that go into craftsmanship. Craftsmanship in Africa is much, much more robust. And I think like there's a lot of things that the West can learn from. And I think there's a lot of things that people in the West can, and you can relate to people as human beings. And then you can see, okay, I see, you have a life and you have a beautiful life, but it's different from my, what appears to be a comfortable or nice place, but and in its own way, it has this thing. So, I encourage people to, 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 to pursue those kind of volunteer opportunities where you get to meet people below what's in the, in the iceberg theory called below the surface. Go yeah, below I like that. that idea because when they when they come, when they came to me and my immediate thought was like, oh well, no offense, I didn't say this, but no offense, but what do we need your knitting for? That you know they'd weave and do all kinds of stuff in Ethiopia, but you're right, it's better to look at it like they can teach their way and someone can teach their yeah, you but, know, in a different yeah, way. But yeah, but there's, there's a certain kind of knitting that I've never seen in Ethiopia that people do here that I've seen. I like, you know, I've seen people knit together a sweater, but I've seen people knit together intricate things here on this side right. uh, when I was in Minnesota. So it's something that is interesting that you could you could pick it up if you want That's to pick idea. it up. But only on personally. Definitely, definitely. Thank you both of you. That's uh, Ari, I think you already uh, when I invited you, it's like I knew you're going to connect and then says, I'm going to do something too. So you're a door too. So I love that part. And then you've been, um, uh, how do I call it? Uh, I love the way um, Eleanor said it. Once you join, you never leave. So <laughs> <laughs> in a non creepy way, right? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> no, no, I, I love that part because that's where the personal <laughs> involvement and everything else comes. To just let me come to you. Uh, we talked about, you know, the innovation, the STEM part. So uh, why is it so important for you, uh, for kids, especially in Africa, to be involved with this? And then how do you make this personal for yourself? Like the, the kind of involvement that you have with it, what does it mean? And how do you translate it uh, to make sure that it's available for as many kids as possible who never really have the privilege sometimes? Yeah, so like uh, I said earlier, I grew up back home, right? I, I went to school until um, and finished high school there. Um, even so, knowing that uh, when throughout my um, um, going to school, I don't have that. Like after seventh grade, everything was in English, and everything we learned in chemistry, biology. I was uh, major in natural science um, after on the eleventh and twelfth uh, grades. Um, but uh, when it comes to laboratory, we don't have the proper apparatus, so we were just learning through. 
asthma at that time. So we never had that, um, not even the uh, uh, our native language, translated language. Uh, we don't even have the right, um, we don't even have a laboratory. We just learn the theory and we so and then we watched the video, the laboratory through video. So we never had that. So uh, when I got involved in the translating STEM program, I took it personally because I want the future kids to have this um, opportunity that I did not have back home. Um, and knowing that I major chemistry and I also had. Um, um, opportunities to work in a laboratory. Um, so I took it personally, uh, a personal, and I personally sat and actually not only translating, and I also uh, added a few things in here and there. Uh, Dr. Warku can uh, back me up on this um, because it was so personal to me, and I want the kids at least they have both in, uh, in English and also in Amharic and hopefully other uh, other um, um, by colleagues who speak different language like Afan Oromo and Tigray, Tigraya and Ainoa can translate that chemistry, biology, physics that we uh, collaboratively did so that each uh, community can have uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, so that's how I, I took it personal and that's how uh, I um, um, involved in, in, in happy uh, that the fact that I'm involved in Hopefully, um, I get to do this more, and I'm, I can say I'm confident to uh, write uh, a lot of chemistry manual books, um, more books in the future when we have opportunities and times so, um, to do that. So, um, and Tigus is a little modest. She improved what we did a lot. The first thing she said is, where's the glossary, right? Like we need to define all these words. So yeah, Tigus didn't have little ideas. Tigus had great, <laughs> big, bold ideas that took the project from being able to be supported for a local community to something that we're hopeful we can actually roll out. We're gonna pilot with different schools that but actually can support teachers around the country. And again, that translation, she spent her time volunteering, translating. These manuals are 100 pages each. And if you translate, you understand that's a lot of translation. Um, the other thing Tigus does for our local translations, because we're now printing locally in Addis, as I mentioned, is we learned from a literacy expert that we had a lot of information in the back about the author, say Dr. Ruku or Jane, or about the story, the Rifali, or Harar, or Lalibella, that was in English, and we were removing it when we printed in Ethiopia. But they said, leave it in, translate it. So Tigus, we're like, we have, and again, that's a much more content rich, and we've been when printing 10 different books in Amharic each quarter this year, it's been a pilot year for us, but every time it's Tigus, here's the next 10 books. Like, can you fit it in all the other things? Cause Tigus is a very busy lady. So this is her volunteer project. And we have never gotten a no from her and she delivers on time and high quality. And again, these books would have otherwise been in English, but for us, we're not publishing anything in that isn't accessible by local communities. Um, so, but we couldn't do it without someone who has those language skills. And again, those ideas on how to make it better. So Tigus, where I'm gonna give you my shout out, which I do to women and modest men, take credit for your accomplishments, be confident and own it. You did really, really great work for us. And the next time you introduce, uh, you wanna say, I improved the manuals. So that's my challenge to you. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's definitely the woman empowerment that we call it about just the way you just described it. And then being humble, I think, comes in also with growing up in Ethiopia. We all have it. So definitely, this is something that I definitely appreciate. And I'm glad Eleanor was able to give you your kudos. And then we went through it. And then I like the way you also you said thank you for it. So that shows how humble you are also with it at the same time. So thank you. Ezra, let me come to you. Tell us about your students. I mean, Dr. Work, we talked about it. Coding, sometimes it's just I see it as you take an idea, 
you put it into programming and then you come up with something else that kids and everybody can enjoy on screen and other places. So tell us a little bit about your students, how they are taking this, how they are enjoying it and how they are being transformed through the program. And can I add <laughs> one thing? Cause I would love you to start Ezra with the students who couldn't join us because they're very busy at university here in the U.S. But yes. to tell us a little bit about Theo and Jonas and Abebe yeah. and um, the others who built the program for us, young people who okay. built it, and then the, the students who are now benefiting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Is it okay to answer the question you asked? The beautiful tickets over there dressed in KPM clothes. That's right. Is it okay? <laughs> I attempt uh, that question as well because I think it's relevant to us as well. Why is it important? It and is. then I and then answer the second question. If that's okay, of course. With you. Please go ahead. Okay, something that's something you have been prepared for to come and answer because this is so so important to me personally, and it's something that we need to have a context. Context is important. What we're dealing with, what the problem we're dealing with, is very important. And what we're trying to address is more than just teaching people how to code, but in the process we're also thinking about how to resolve even much 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 more deeper problems. Uh, to give you a context, uh, uh, so the, the overall education problem, you know, people talk about this, build more schools, let's do this, let's do library, laboratories, we do all sort of things. Um, Ethiopia spends about 5% of its GDP. No, no, it's, it's public spending. 5% of its, I think it's 5% of its GDP on education. What, oh, five, oh, no, it's 5% of the government spend. It's usually, I think, we would rank somewhere high. And, and co for comparison to you, for you, and the last data I checked, Sweden spends about five, somewhere between six and seven percent of their um, total output, their total GDP to this. Ethiopia spends about five percent of its GDP on the education. So uh, relatively, Ethiopia is considered on the high end of the number, which is fine. Five percent is actually what you want to be, somewhere above five. Three is too low, five is good. But if you break that down into absolute numbers and you see the crisis that you, you face. So you look at Sweden, Sweden spends about $12,000 per child per year on the education and the education system. And the reason I mentioned Sweden, Sweden is very active in supporting the education system. They're claiming to donate to us money and stuff like that which is okay. I mean, we like any support is good. Any help is good, but it's better than nothing. So we, so that aside, $12,000. You go to Africa, Africa spent about $120 billion in education of its GDP, which is about 5% of the GDP on an annual basis. And if you break it down to per person in Africa, that comes to about $92 per person on education. The scale of gap, that we're trying to gap is like even this screen is not gonna be enough to resolve it. So what so I mean all the employees that have been hired in Ethiopia, all the schools that have been built looks massive and large scale. But if you put it in context, it's minute compared to what is needed to fulfill the promise of an education system. A promise of an education system we have adopted from places like Sweden. Sweden is successful in their education system because it achieved their goal because they have aligned properly, they managed to mobilize the resources necessary to meet the needs that it needs to, to, to fulfill. Now, my analysis is, can be a little bit quite simplistic. It's not a research uh, presentation here. So you, can, you don't have to grill me on nuances here and nuances there. They are there, those things are there. I'm not discounting them, but it gives, uh, just to give you an, an, the kind of scale we're talking about. So if Ethiopia is like going to put in cumulatively that for the next 100 years, that additional, let's say 10%, even scale it up to 10%, and assuming the GDP grows by 10% every year, it will not, we will still not catch up with Sweden in the next 100 years. So we have adopted their education system, which is fine. That's not, a, personally, I would not do it, but if I adopt the education system, I have to back it with the resource because it's inherent in its system of education in the West, inherent in its system of the education in the West, for it to succeed, it needs to be aligned with its resources. But in Africa, we don't have that. 
We have adopted it, but we don't have the resources. Even if you want to mobilize the resources, you are mobilizing from very limited resources, $2.4 trillion in total in Africa, $100 billion in Ethiopia. So 5% of half a trillion dollars of Ethiopia is still not going to be enough. So that said, I joined uh, the Open Heart Big Dream because it aligned with, it, it felt like a space I can experiment on a whole range of possibilities. What are the breakthroughs that we need to circumvent all these resource bottlenecks? Of course, resource piling is part of it. Like if China one day says, or America one day says, you know what? Instead of giving you breadcrumbs, I'm, we're going to be really committed to you. Instead of $5 billion, you need $100 billion. We're going we're gonna to be committed to education and give you $100 billion of a Marshall plan. I'm all for that. But that's not going to happen very soon if, if it is if it's in the pipeline, okay. neither from coming from China or anybody. These guys are kind and generous to keep us alive, but they're not going to be kind and generous to, to fork what is take away from their children and give it to us. So instead of complaining about, oh, aid is no, 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 what is the innovation that we need? How do we break through that? So Open Heart Big Dream is allowing us to experiment on that. So this program that we've designed, it's not perfect. It's very imperfect because it's, 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 uh, most of it's a hypothesis, like the way I'm talking about hypothesis, very untested, still need to be proven, a lot of proven uh, concept, uh, proving that need to happen. That said, we're trying to figure out, okay, how do I get one computer science educator to teach many kids that are disparately connected, disconnected from us? We're hoping to do it in Makale, but Makale was not possible. We're hoping to do Addis Ababa was not possible because of pandemic. But we are experimenting a little bit with Dredoa. And still, it's a relative success. It's not, I won't call it a full success, but it's a relative success for experimenting phase. But what we have managed to do is that we managed to bring in experts at organization, operation, experts at synthesizing curriculum, experts at working, figuring out how to recruit, uh, identify, find, and recruit these kids, potential kids, experts uh, who are locally located, committed to that, to the to what to the mission, who can be utilized to some degree to implement the process. So basically. We've created a classroom that doesn't depend on building very expensive buildings. We've created a classroom that doesn't involve us having to purchase a huge amount of computers and PCs. We've created a classroom just using, what, $30,000? Just what would normally cost somewhere between somewhere half a million to $5 million. So we, we still in the process of trying to see what that is and kind of have an, an opportunity to reflect on it. So what that's what the overall, what is it? We are innovating on how we deliver something. So I can deliver, so Tigis can be a chemistry teacher to 500 kids at the same time. So you don't have to train like, you know, 25 uh, per 25 students, you need to have one chemistry teacher. Yeah. So we wait for our training facilities to train them well. No, I can get to this to teach 500 students without having to feel like she's teaching 500. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and then yeah. you can create localized communities where, where you, they don't have to be expert educators. They just have to be facilitators where, you know, exercises, practices, laboratories could be for a child in Borona who has to be a shepherd. Their laboratory could be taking out the wind patterns on the way to their 24 hour truck, somewhere to feed their water, the water, take that water test, test the water and document it, register it, send it to a virtual platform. And then that is their experiment right there. And then somewhere in uh, uh, La Libala, it could be about checking the sediment, studying how did the La Libala uh, last for this long? And then what are the tests that we could do? So the child doesn't have to wait until the school is built to actually go to school. They can actually do the school and their farms and their homes. And, and then so you can contextualize education so low. So you, you lower the bar of having to study high end of this European stuff and lower the bar so low. And then whoever has to raise the bar is the, that child that's humanized that is liberated, that feels confident. I'm at home. 
I don't have to trek mountains of the Lalibela to go to a school five kilometers away, having 20, 30% danger of falling off the cliff. You don't have to do that. So you, you eliminate it. And then you don't have to wait for Ethiopian government to find its way around to getting the economy to be $2 trillion, to be able to raise the funds, to be able to build a school so close to you and your community, bring the board brand. You don't have to wait, and which is 100 years. Then we, we find a way. So that's, uh, so that's what we do. So we brought in a number of smart and talented people, uh, people I work with. We just finished with one of our students, was one of my former students. He's working at Facebook in Seattle right now. His name is Ababa. We covered uh, like you know very deep substantive stuff when it comes to database, uh, back end, anything that you can think about back end, we've covered it. And so, so Petra, Ezra, I'm gonna very, interrupt you yes, for one second because yes. I think you touched a couple of good points. I just want to really highlight and summarize. So one we're trying proof of concept, right? We're really trying to pilot and show that with a small amount of money and some really innovative approaches, we can give young people the tools to change their future, right? That, and the leadership. And we also believe, as Ezra talked about, that the best solutions are local solutions, right? The best models are local models. People within communities know best. And how do we, how do we help them unleash their own power. And then as Ezra talked about the, the, the ability to scale, right? Like right. you can either wait for more money or you can find a scaling solution, right? You can either wait for someone else to help you or you can find the way to help yourself. So I think Ezra has, as you could tell, you will not be surprised Ezra has an economics background, right? To hear that, because I, and I think, and he yeah. thinks in systems, right? And I think our goal is to think systemically so we can have an outsized impact by yeah. everything that's done by everyone. And Ezra and the team have done an amazing job doing something that frankly should have been impossible once conflict and COVID came in. We were supposed to run these classes in what work we described as these American corners that had all these resources. Now we have no we resources. Don't have that. We don't have and access to them. We had the option, Ezra didn't meant this, we had the option to delay till things were better yeah. um, or to move forward. And Ezra and the team and Worku and I were all on board. We move forward because if we can find a solution and Ezra and the team have not perfect solution, perfection is often the enemy of the good, uh, but good solution, good solution yeah. <laughs> that is showing these young people that you can find a way through or over or under if there's an obstacle or you can stop, yeah. but that's your choice. And I think what Ezra and his team are modeling is how to find those solutions with the resources and the, the, the tools currently available so that the future looks different. So I mean, Ezra, thank you, you for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Let me just say this just, quickly because we have about only yeah. five minutes left to end the program okay. so that we can uh, bring it all together. I wanted mm -hmm. to hear specifically about the students benefiting from it. If you can tell yes. us a little bit on those students aspect of yes. it. And then I'll give everybody so, a chance to do a closing. I mean, we have to do we have to deal with a little bit of these complications of pandemic, uh, organizations, operations, you know, the kind of misalignments in between. But through and through what we've managed to do is, is we've managed to provide students a very rigorous into, uh, introduction to computer science and computer boot, uh, like it's a boot camp. It's, it's, it's rigorous. It's not a light walk through and stuff from, from HTML, CSS, to website building, to JavaScript, to creating dynamic websites, to database management, to backend. Now we are finishing up with Python uh, as a tool, but we're also looking at you know, uh, crypto, uh, uh, cryptography, like you know, complicated, sophisticated security infrastructure apparatus, creating algorithm, all of those things. I mean, I already have people, like some of the students are like already harassing me on the side. Oh, I have an idea for this. I have an idea for that. Can I do this? What can I do? So the students are benefiting, not just on the content of what they've been learning, but in between those lessons, we also have leadership seminars that we've managed to put in there. Leadership courses are where we bring in, you know, people, expert leaders in their field. So that to humanize and make it easy. So you don't want to be a computer science expert, but you want to be a leader. 
And I, I go on saying that I don't want you to just envision yourself working at Microsoft. I want you to create him in Microsoft, building yes. in Microsoft. So like, you know, even better than Microsoft. I think Microsoft probably is a better, but better than Facebook. But Microsoft is I see it's in a different class. The face, better than Facebook, which is attention economy. Create something that transforms, like cryptocurrency. I mean, the biggest, I, I, I sent it yesterday, I was working with somebody, and then I met these people who said, the biggest interesting thing happening in, in the world is happening in Ethiopia. Ethiopia has signed the biggest blockchain deal ever in the world. Five million Ethiopian kids are going to be on this blockchain technology where the education, this is the Minister of Education signed a deal that it's not, it's under the radar. It's happened in August. We are in the middle of a war, you don't hear it. But this is a process that happened. So our kids are being empowered, not just with tools and content, but also with the kind of sense that this is something that you could use to go out there and right away build the stuff. And then very soon we are transitioning. I had a little bit of call, I couldn't finish this up. Uh, this this week, uh, this uh, past weekend, this uh, starting from so uh, we were finishing up on starting uh, an internship course starting from January like January on for another six months where we some of the students will go join us in the business interpretation completion communication platform where we further strengthen those uh, capabilities. But what why do I say all of these things? I am we need people, we need experts. So whoever is listening, I, I had to go all the way up to down. And then thank you, for, uh, Eleanor, for helping me that, with that process. It's because we, I wanted to give you the problem we're trying to solve in the spectrum. And then yes. for that, you could see yourself, oh, I can see something myself for myself in there. Thank you. Uh, so we have about one minute. I'm, I want to give everyone a closing statement. Uh, Eleanor, especially when you do yours, I'm going to come to you at the end how people can get involved and how they can they find you, all those things I'm going to come. So let me start with Dr. Worko, just short closing statement, then I'll go to Tigist, Ezra, Ari, and then I'll come to uh, Eleanor and uh, uh, Leila. So Dr. Worko, just a short closing statement uh, for what people you want people to know. You're muted. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there is a saying, uh, but I don't remember who said it. Uh, there is no calamity not to dream, but it is a calamity that not to dream. That it is not a calamity to die with uh, dreams unfulfilled, but it is a calamity not to dream. So big hearts, big dreams, open hearts, big dreams. Support us so that we can reach out to children who have no the opportunity to go to school. Let us give them the gift of reading and literacy. That is the best gift we can ever offer. Thank you very much. Amen to that. I like that. Tigist, any closing statement that you may have? Yes, so my closing statement will be, uh, you just have to be kind to help others. Uh, teach um, others to teach. Uh, leadership is very important, but leadership with kind heart. So, uh, and also know that when you help others, uh, the first person who will be benefit is you. So once I find, <laughs> I am a humanity, um, but uh, finding open hearts, big dreams, and then other uh, charity group that I'm involved in, um, the more I contribute, the more I think myself that, oh my God, I am a good person. Um, being young, uh, instead of wasting my time uh, going um, somewhere that is always feel like it's not me uh, but I feel like I found my purpose uh, by uh, working with this amazing people open heart big dream is very personal to me uh, I'm hoping uh, that we will do great things we will collaborate with the Ethiopian uh, government and education uh, sector so that we can assist them we can work with them and we can show them hey we know the struggles we can work with you guys but we're not strong enough also we want to respect the culture 
uh, of uh, Ethiopian um, culture, but we also add, we want to add the uh, a modernity of teaching style, integrity, uh, professionalism. Don't take anything personal. But here we are to help. So open heart, big dream is a charity that I am in. So please, if you are intelligent enough, but have a good heart to help in uh, impact the your community uh, in a positive way, please come and join us. Um, that's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. I like that. Ezra, any closing statements? Thank you. Thank you. Because, and thank you, guys. Uh, I mean, uh, it is like the name says, open your heart to big dreams. I think big dreams is nothing, it doesn't say it is too big a dreams, any kind of dream. So we're looking for people who are dreamers, who are, who are interested in, in really appreciating the complexity and the, the, the vastness and the collaboration necessary to, op to do these things. That open heartness is about opening yourself to others and opening yourself to the ideas and innovations and to creating new possibilities. There's nothing that uh, that I, I would outline, I, I outlined earlier, that's impossible to resolve. And, you know, in, in, if Sweden is an example, is an example of a country that has figured out a resolve something that is not working for them. And we have to find a way to resolve it. And we have it in us. It's in us. This is in our hearts. This is in our mind. This is in our spirit. So it's, it's in our intellect. So we can do it, we can come together, do it. If you have something that you can contribute a portion, a part or full that you can help do in one way or another, just, you know, you know, you know who to reach out. Thank you, thank you, Ezra. We have a lot to follow up through because we need to unpack all of that in a different kind of program too. So thank you for everything that you do, Ari, yeah. and thank you for being here. I wanna give you also the same kind of uh, closing a statement, anything that you wanna say before I go to Ariel and Leila. Oh yeah, thank you again uh, for including me. Um, I only have one question that I meant to ask at the same time as the illustration question and it, uh, we'll keep it short. You can make it a really short answer for me. Um, so you are looking for, you look for illustrators. What about uh, uh, people who actually want to share stories? You also looking for people to share stories in different languages in Ethiopian language. Okay, just curious. Absolutely. That's all I want. Yeah. Yes. Okay, will do. Leila, let me come to you. If you want to say anything, especially to your generation of kids, any cl closing statement that you have, anything that you want to share to the world. Um, I want everyone to know that there are so many different ways that you can help put a, um, a book in every kid in Ethiopia's hands. Um, you can reach us on Amazon. You can reach us on Sodero. I hope. Sodero, Sodero store. Sodero store. You can create read to me books and send them to us so that we can post them on YouTube while you read one of our books. Um, and then you can tell your school library or or anywhere about us and just spread the word about what we do. Thank you, thank you, Leila. Eleanor, thank you for creating this and uh, leading it. And it's an honor to have you on the Yoftahe show. So of all of you, you have created an amazing team. And I love the title also, Open Hearts, Big Dreams. So um, where can they find you? How can people get involved? And then any closing statement that you want to say with that? Well, you can find us at openheartsbigdreams.org. And we'd love to hear from you. We are a global team. We will be finished when the challenges are solved. So we need everyone. We do believe we're in this together as a human race. So we welcome people from anywhere and everywhere, from young people to people who are in retirement. There's always a place or a way to contribute. Um, and the closing remark I would leave, because I think you've heard from all of this, we're, everyone here has big dreams and there's no dream too big. So I would leave for you the importance of hope and optimism and the quote, it always seems impossible until it's done. And we thought what we've accomplished so far when Jane and I first talked was impossible, but we're now at 115 books in seven languages. That wasn't possible, but now it's done. 
And so now Ezra, Worku, Ari, Tigist, yourself are challenges. What's the next impossible that we can talk to you about in a year or two and say, now that is done and we're on to the next challenge. So it's always impossible until it's done. If you have a big dream, go for it because you have no idea what can happen when you put that out in the universe. Thank you, thank you, it's amazing. And then I love the word impossible because if you support it a little bit, it just says impossible. So <laughs> exactly, <laughs> nothing exactly. is impossible. So definitely everybody has to open their hearts to understand culture, to understand new things, and then big dream to create that world that we all envision. That's all it is. We're connecting the dots with beautiful people, with beautiful hearts, with big dreams to be able to accomplish amazing things. So, I mean, Arian, you never met before and now Ari is offering to bring so many things that she has in there. And then I love the passion Ezra talked about. To guess not only the way you presented yourself, it was your closing and then Ezra pointed out how you're communicating with it. And Dr. Worko, I love also your story the way it is. And I can imagine it when every villager coming into your house or everybody coming in and asking you to read those letters for them. And then it led you to this. And then you're trying to break that cycle and say, now I need to make that accessible to it. And you just presented two amazing daughters of both of them fully accomplished. And that says a lot of you, where you came from, how you build on it and what you are giving back. This is the story that all of us need to hear and follow through. So I'm really humbled even to be part of this experience and hearing uh, the story that you just shared. So uh, I'm full leaving this show uh, instead of just teaching it for others. I've been filled and I've been blessed with it, everything that you all have said. And then you, each of you, what I have learned is you have your, I need to create a, a story and a whole show just on for each of you, not only just giving you 10 minutes to, to talk about. So we will connect uh, because together we all know what's going on in Ethiopia right now. And the only way we can solve it is by changing the mindset. The only way we can solve it by teaching each, every single child, because we don't want to pass what we have right now to the next generation. And then everything comes in by us being willing to change and by us willing to invest on those kids. It's an investment of time, investment of money, investment of our knowledge. And anything that we do, we have to be willing to give three things, our money, our time, and our knowledge. That's how change happens. And then there is no big, small, every little thing that we do. And just like Tiga said it earlier, if I can say how I'm a good person, if I'm helping one person and everything starts with one, that the power of one, reaching out to one person, that's how everything is. We don't have to reach 100,000 people to help everything please reach out to one person that we can help and we can change the world with that one change because that person is going to do it for another person and it's a domino effect that's going to come with it by just us willing to change first ourselves and then making sure to transfer that to one more person. So I love open heart, big dreams. And we are ending up with this with our open heart, even getting bigger. And then... I'm going to say it and then big dream. We're going to have more conversation for the followers who are watching. It's going to be uploaded also on YouTube. You can find us on Yoftahesha on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook. Please make sure to share this so that everybody, and I'll post also the website so that people can follow and donate as much as you can, your time, your volunteerism. That's how the only way we can change it. Once again, peace to Mama Ethiopia, to the whole East. I will come together, everything that chaos that we see right now, this is now we're gonna end. We're gonna have a much better time and then education is gonna be the big part of it to change all of that. Thank you, bless you all, go in peace Thank until you. we meet again. So uh, we'll talk again. Thank you for everything that you do because you're changing the world with everything that you do. And Leila, you are the next one taking over. So we're coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you all have a good day have a blessed day have a good day bye yes